go ahead and get started with our presentation today. I um, just want to tell everyone good afternoon and thanks for joining us. Welcome to the My Horse University and University of Minnesota's live webcast titled Applications for Equine Genetics. This presentation the, is the second of seven webcasts offered in a series to bring horse enthusiasts the most up-to-date information on equine genetics. This series is funded by the United States Department of Agriculture's National Research Initiative. Future webcasts will focus on management of equine metabolic syndrome and shivers and advances in equine genetics. Our presenter today is Dr. Stephanie Valberg, professor and director of the University of Minnesota Equine Center in St. Paul, Minnesota. She received her undergraduate degree and DVM from the Ontario Veterinary College, completed a PhD in equine exercise physiology at the Swedish University of Animal Science, as well as a residency in internal medicine at the University of California, Davis. She is a board certified internal medicine clinician at the University of Minnesota, and her research centers on neuromuscular diseases in horses with a special focus on genetic diseases of skeletal muscle and their nutritional management. Dr. Valberg has received several research awards and is a frequent speaker at national and international veterinary, nutrition, and genetic conferences. Please note that you are able to ask questions during the presentation using the text chat um, on the left-hand side of your screen. The questions today will be facilitated by Dr. Jim Mickelson, Professor of Veterinary Biosciences from the University of Minnesota. The presentation today will be recorded and uploaded to our website if you want to review it at a later date. And at this time, I will turn the presentation over to Dr. Thank Robert. you very much, and thank you, everybody, for joining us. I am uh, hoping that you can hear me, and I'm going to present some of summaries of equine genetics, go over some of the basics first, and then talk about applications of genetic testing. And uh, a lot of the research component of this were discoveries that were made together with my colleagues uh, Dr. Jim Mickelson and Molly McHugh in our genetics-focused uh, research group here at the University of Minnesota. So just a brief review to begin with, and then as you probably all know from watching Forensic Science, there is um, a concentration of genetic material, DNA, which is organized on two chromosomes, and that's organized in, in the form of genes. And in the horse, there are about 20,000 equine genes, and they're spread out on a on 33 pairs of chromosomes, and then there are also uh, sex chromosomes, XX or XY, depending on being female or male. So the function of genes is to have a special code that results in the production of a protein. And genes will vary in their genetic sequence, and by varying their genetic sequence, that changes t the type of protein that they code for. So variations in the genetic code, and consequently variations in the proteins that are produced, account for many of the differences that you see between individuals and between different species. There is, however, a remarkable degree of similarity between the genetic code between different species as well. So as I mentioned, uh, there are 20,000 genes, and they are paired. And you receive one of those genes from the father in the form of the sperm, and then one of the genes would be found from the mother in the egg. And they will combine then to, to have pairs, and they may have slight differences between one and gene and another. So for example, the genetic code in one gene may code for the production of blue eyes, and the genetic code in the same pair would uh, code for something slightly different like brown eyes. So the different, slight differences between these pairs are often the term you'll hear is alleles. So there are two alleles of a gene, meaning that they have just slight differences. A mutation occurs when the genetic code within that gene is slightly changed. And because of that change in the sequence of the genetic code, you'll have a change in the protein that's produced. And by changing the protein, you may change the function of that particular protein. And that can result in a disease, or it can result in a different trait, like a different coat color, for example. And the cells divide in the body all of the time, and as they are undergoing cellular division, you can spontaneously have small mutations that occur, but most of the time the cells will be able to recognize those changes in the genetic code and fix them so that um, they're not passed along to descendants. But sometimes DNA repair mechanisms can fail or they can be overwhelmed, and repair mechanisms become less efficient with age. So if you have some of those mutations that don't get fixed in the developing sperm or the developing egg, 
they can be passed along and that mutation then will be transmitted from the sire and dam to the offspring. It's important to recognize when we're talking about these genetic mutations the pattern in which they're passed on because that's going to affect our ability to control them through different breeding programs. So I want to go over just two of the basic patterns of inheritance of simple traits, one being recessive and one being dominant. If we're talking about a recessive trait, it means that the genetic mutation has to exist in both the chromosome inherited from the sire and the chromosome inherited from the dam in order for an alteration to occur in the protein that's produced. So that in a recessive trait, if both genes are changed, then you will have uh, a disease that can be produced. Uh, and that's the component of being recessive is that you have a mutation in both the gene from the sire and the gene from the dam. So this is an example of how recessive uh, traits can produce disease. And that occurs when horses that are carriers, which means that one of the genes has the mutation and the other doesn't. So the mutation here is shown as the pink uh, gene and the normal gene is the black gene. If you breed two carriers together, that can result in either a, a pink gene being inherited from both the sire and the dam, in which case you'd have two copies of the mutation and that animal would show signs of a recessive disease. It can result in a 50% chance of an animals just being carriers that are born from two carrier parents, or a 25% chance that they'll get the normal gene from the sire and the normal gene from the dam, and they will be completely normal. So in most instances, recessive traits are passed along because two carriers are mated. If you mate a carrier to a normal individual, then you may have either a 50% chance of having a completely normal individual, or you may have a 50% chance of a carrier, but you won't have a disease being produced. And also, if you have a very common trait and you mate two recessive individuals, if it's not a lethal trait, then all of their offspring will always be recessive since the genes are the same from the sire and the dam in, in um, both pairs. So that becomes important when we're talking about breeding trials because you have carriers and you can try to breed, avoid breeding carriers and thereby avoid producing pr affected individuals. With a dominant trait, that means that you only require that one copy of the gene is defective for the trait to be expressed. So you only have to inherit, inherit that abnormality from either the sire or the dam and the genetic disease will be expressed because that is enough to change the protein function um, that's a result of, what, of that genetic code. And the other thing that's important to note is that if you have a dominant trait, you don't have carriers. You either have that genetic mutation and you're affected or you don't have it and you're normal. There's not a carrier situation for a dominant trait. So as an example, if you take an animal that has a dominant trait, and that's exemplified here by the blue gene, and cross that with a normal individual, 50% of the offspring will be affected. They will have that dominant gene, 50% chance um, that they will be completely normal and have the two normal genes. So it doesn't matter who you're breeding to, if you have a dominant trait, you have at least a 50% chance of producing an affected foal. If you happen to breed two individuals that have the dominant trait, you even have an even greater chance of having a foal with the disease because there is a 25% chance that they will have both copies of the abnormal trait in which they would be homozygous for the dominant gene, 50% chance that one of the genes will be abnormal. So all, th all of these together, 75% chance of having an animal that's affected and a 25% chance that they'll have the normal gene. And if you happen to breed two animals that are dominant together, then the offspring, uh, homozygous off dominant, the offspring will always be affected. So one of the questions that often arises then is, for example, an animal that has HYPP, that you will have a great deal of variety in the severity of the clinical signs that they will exhibit. And in some cases, a genetic test will be performed and the owner is completely unsuspicious of, or not suspecting that this animal is going to have a genetic trait. 
because it doesn't seem to show signs, and yet the genetic test shows that for a dominant trait, the gene, or one of the genes has the mutation, which by definition means that it has HYPP, since HYPP is a dominant trait. And one of the reasons why that may be that you will have two individuals that have the same genetic makeup and the same genetic mutation but different severity of clinical signs can be um, differences in the environment and the way that they were raised and the diet that they're fed. For example, horses with HYPP tend to show worse clinical signs if they're on a high potassium diet. But the other reason may be that there are other genes in the body that may have an effect on the, on the expression of the disease. And as an example of that, the horse that's shown in the picture here is a horse that was heterozygous so it, for HYPP mutation, but also happened to have the mutation for tying up called polysaccharide storage myopathy. And the fact that it had both of these muscle diseases uh, that are inherited traits made the clinical expression much more severe in this case. So there are a variety of things that can affect how the genetic expression called the, the phenotype the disease that occurs, even though they have exactly the same genetic makeup. So how do we know what genetic uh, diseases there are and what the genetic mutations are in horses to date? I just kind of wanted to walk you through a couple of examples of how we discover genetic mutations. And it often starts with a very observant veterinarian who recognizes that the disease that they're seeing is not exactly like the things that they have recognized before or that there's a cluster of abnormalities and they're seeing the number of foals like this or adults like this and it, it must be a separate disease. And as an example, I'm going to show you a video that was taken by uh, Dr. Beatrice Sponsler in Iowa of a foal that she thought had a, a different disease uh, and it's going to show you this video now. Um, could we rewind the video, please? This foal had a great deal of difficulty standing up right from birth. It was born with a low body temperature. The tendons in its legs were slightly contracted, so you'll notice that it's over at the knee. It doesn't stand perfectly straight on its knee. And it got to the point where it couldn't stand up on its own because it was so weak. Uh, with assistance, it was able to stand, but the foal was always a little bit uh, less active than other animals in the, in the herd, and eventually this foal uh, was unable to, to uh, thrive and survive and ended up being euthanized due to the inability to stand. So while this condition has some similarities to other diseases, um, the recognition of this uh, as being a muscle disease came about by uh, the thorough physical examination and also being able to do blood tests, and the blood test indicated that there might be a, a muscle disease in this foal, and it seemed to be a fairly unusual case. Okay, you can turn the video off. So, the um, in order to further investigate the muscle problem in this case, a muscle biopsy was taken, and that's a, something that we specialize in our laboratory is looking at muscle samples and trying to identify muscle diseases. And this slide shows you the normal staining for sugar in the muscle called glycogen. And this is what that foal's muscle biopsy looked like. It had no normal staining, but it had these very bizarre globular shapes of abnormal sugar in the muscle. So we knew that this might be glycogen branching enzyme deficiency because we were familiar with what this picture looked like in humans and we knew that in humans this type of muscle biopsy finding is an inherited disease that's due to a lack of a protein called glycogen branching enzyme. It's a protein that's responsible for making the normal storage form of sugar in the muscle. So then the next step then is to see if that protein is functioning properly and we looked to see what the activity was of that protein in the muscle and found that in normal foals the activity was quite high but in that affected foal there was no enzyme activity. So that was an indication that yes this could exactly be the same disease as in humans which we know is an inherited disease. We also wanted to see is their amount of protein the same so we can stain with an antibody that shows whether or not that protein exists in um, tissues that are spread out on a gel like this, and we found again that there was no protein 
uh, in the affected foal and half the normal amount of protein in the mother of the foal uh, compared to normal horses. So this was a further indication that we had a disease uh, that was in a gene that was responsible for coding for the glycogen branching enzyme protein. So the next step was therefore to look at that specific gene and we did that by sequencing the gene in, in a series of overlapping steps using something called PCR that amplifies the gene and then we can look at the sequence and align all of these overlapping pieces of genetic sequence out of the GBE1 gene. And when we did that, we found there was one change in the gene. It was a change in the genetic code. And when we looked at what the, that coding was for, it changed the coding for a portion of the protein, an amino acid called tyrosine, to a sign that the gene should stop translating and making protein, uh, called a premature stop codon. So in the affected foals, they had two copies of this mutation, one from the sire, one from the dam. They didn't make the proper amount of protein because they were given an, an abnormal signal to stop making that protein. And that's why we found no activity and no staining for the protein in the muscle. We were able to identify 12 other foals from veterinarians around the country that alerted us to potential candidates. And we found that in all of those 12 foals, both the copies of the genes had that particular mutation. And we were also able to do a genetic sequence on the parents of some of those foals, and we found that one of the copies of the genes was abnormal in the parents, and uh, the other one was normal. So if we have both copies mutated in the affected foal, one copy in the parent, and, and we don't find the mutation in normal individuals, that made us aware of the fact that we were probably dealing with an inherited uh, recessive disorder. So the question always arises from horse owners then, well, where does this come from? Can you look at a pedigree and say, okay, this is exactly where the disease is coming from. So we looked at the pedigrees from all of the 12 affected foals to see what pattern we saw. And if we traced it back seven to nine generations, we could find a common sire and dam on both the, the uh, sire and dam side. We could find a common horse. Um, so there seemed to be a founder or one individual that was present in all of the foal's pedigrees. And that individual was king in all of the cases but one. And in one case, we had to trace the dam back one generation further to king's sire, Xantanon. However, when we took all of our normal individuals, we found that if you looked at all of the healthy individuals that didn't have the genetic mutation, 95% of them trace back to King as well. And that's just a phenomena that we see in horses. They have a lot of, of uh, sires in common, particularly when you go back to the origin of the breed. So it's very difficult to just look at a pedigree and predict whether or not a genetic mutation is going to be present in the pedigree, unless it's a very recent genetic mutation. If it's an ancient genetic mutation, it's difficult to trace by family lines. So the problem that we had also when we looked further with glycogen branching enzyme deficiency is it turned out that it was only a small percentage of foals that were born alive, and all of them subsequently died. But most of the foals that had this recessive trait actually were aborted. And so it's probably more common to have the clinical signs of abortion in the dam than it is to actually have a foal born and die from this, this really tragic disease. So the most common presenting complaint is likely mares that keep slipping foals or losing foals if they have, if they carry glycogen branching enzyme deficiency and they're bred to another carrier of GBED. So once we've identified a genetic mutation like that, you can develop a test that just looks for that very specific genetic mutation. So it's not a test that's going to sequence the gene again. It just focuses in on that one area where you have a change in the base pairs and, it, and the test is developed so it looks for that. And the tests are usually run on uh, hair that's pulled from the mane or, th or the tail. The important part being you need at least 20 hairs and they're pulled out so that the roots are intact because the DNA is found in the roots of the hairs. And some labs also uh, will extract the DNA from white blood cells that are found in, in blood samples. So either uh, whole blood samples or hair roots are usually used to test for that very specific um, base pair sequence change in the gene. 
And that's the technique that was used for most of the genetic mutations that we know to date. And it's called a candidate gene approach because the only way previously that we could identify a genetic mutation is if we had a good guess as to what the protein was that was abnormal. So the first genetic mutation that was discovered is HYPP, hyperkalemic periodic paralysis. And that's a genetic mutation that arose fairly recently in a stallion called Impressive. And it's a dominant mutation. So individuals that inherited one copy of the genetic mutation would develop signs of muscle shaking and tremoring intermittently. And that could progress to the point of paralysis, as you'll see in the horse here, where they're awake and they know what's going on around them, but their muscles are temporarily paralyzed and they can't move and then eventually they will um, recover from that, usually in about 20 minutes to a couple of hours, and be standing up and looking normal in between times. It was also, uh, and that was uh, discovered by Dr. Sharon Spear, it was also the way that a condition in paints was discovered, which is called a vera lethal white syndrome. And in that case, foals were born that were completely white, and they lacked the normal intestinal motility, and that therefore developed a colic uh, and si signs, usually within 24 to 48 hours of birth, and had to be euthanized because their intestines didn't function properly, and they couldn't move material through their intestines, and they died from really severe pain if they weren't euthanized. It was the technique that was used to identify uh, severe combined immunodeficiency, which is a condition in Arabians. Uh, it's also a recessive condition, like ovarian lethal white syndrome. And in that case, the foals didn't have a full immunity. And by the time they were three or four months of age, the foals can develop severe infections and usually die from the severe infections. It's the case for the recessive GBEDs we talked about. And that's how the discovery was made of JEB, which is a, a, a nasty condition called junctional epidermal lysobolosa that develops in saddlebreds and also in Belgian foals and their skin isn't properly attached. And these foals are euthanized shortly after birth because they develop horrendous uh, skin lesions because the skin in, in many areas just falls off. So all of these conditions were known to exist in other species, and the gene was guessed at based on the very similar clinical condition to other species. But that really limits genetic discovery to knowing uh, diseases in other species. And there were a number of diseases in horses where we knew that they were likely inherited, but we couldn't find anything similar in other species. And that's where having genetic maps is now really advantageous and allows us to make genetic discoveries that we could never make before. And one example of that would be polysaccharide storage map. The, that's a form of tying up in horses that's existed for hundreds and hundreds of years, and we've never really known what the genetic basis of it is and what causes that particular condition. And we guessed at many different proteins over the years and never found that protein to be particularly abnormal. And really, we're at a point where, without genome mapping, we had no idea where to go. We could identify this disease because when we took muscle biopsies, as is shown here, and stained it for sugar, we had lots of staining for normal sugar, but we also had a very abnormal form of sugar or abnormal polysaccharide that accumulated in the muscle as well. And could we show the video, please, rewound from the beginning? Is the video on? Can anybody hear me? Here we go. This video. Uh, we'll show you a horse that's just starting to exercise, very light exercise, and you can see it's developing stiffness and cramping, a very short, choppy stride. And the muscles become so tight and so cramped up and so painful that you'll see that the horse has a great deal of difficulty moving. And that's why it was called tying up, is because the muscles knotted up so tightly. Um, and it just was an extraordinarily, or is this, an extraordinarily painful condition, often involving the back and the rear limb muscles more so than the neck and the forelimb muscles. So our interest was in trying to understand what the basis of this condition was. And there were uh, a number of breeders that felt like this condition ran in, in families of horses. And as I mentioned, we tried a candidate gene approach. We really didn't know where to go from here. And then um, a 
group of international scientists worked together to develop genome maps for horses. And that allowed us a completely different approach. So when you have genome maps, you don't really need to know what protein or what chromosome uh, or any potential genes. What you do is take a series of horses. In this case, we took 48 horses that had polysaccharide storage myopathy based on the muscle biopsy. 48 horses that we knew were completely normal. These were quarter horses. And we had horses that were similarly related to each other in the control in the PSSM group, so we wouldn't find something that was just based on a very close relationship rather than the presence of a disease. We had markers that were spread out on all of the equine chromosomes. And what we were looking for then was, is there one of these markers that's more highly associated with the diseased horses than it is with normal horses? And what we found was a group of markers that were located on chromosome 10 in the horse had a highly statistically significant association with the PSSM disease. So we knew, based on this result, that somewhere in this region on this chromosome was likely the gene of interest. And now that we have the genome sequenced in the mouse and in humans and now in horses, we can go in and look at the genome sequence and say, well, what genes are there in this area that might make sense? And when we did that, we found a gene called glycogen synthase 1. That's a gene that's responsible for producing glycogen, the storage form of sugar, and that made a lot of sense since these horses stored too much sugar as well as an abnormal sugar. And then we took the same approach as with other muscle diseases. We sequenced this particular gene, and in doing so, we found a genetic uh, mutation. And that mutation was present on one of the chromosomes of affected individuals, which indicated to us that we were dealing with a dominant mutation. And what was unusual about this genetic mutation is it doesn't decrease the function of the, of the protein. It actually increases the function of the protein. So it's called a gain-of-function mutation in that when you have an abnormality, this enzyme is turned on all the time, and it keeps making more and more and more sugar and storing that in the muscle. So the question then arose, well, what line does that come from? And what we found was when we looked at horses that had tying up in a variety of different breeds, we found the same genetic mutation. We found that there were many horses that tie up that don't have this mutation. For example, Arabians and standardbreds and thoroughbreds are breeds in which we have yet to find this mutation. But we found at least 20 breeds of horses a variety of draft horses, some warm-blood horses, Morgans, Tennessee walking horses, Mustangs, that did have this genetic mutation. So it didn't start in the quarter horse by any means. And then Dr. McHugh did a complex statistical analysis to look at, well, how old is this mutation based on the genetic sequence in and around the mutation in different breeds? And our estimate is that we probably, um, this mutation arose when horses were being developed to carry knights into with heavy armor into war. So the foundation of the modern draft horse called the Great Horse, which was founded about 1,200 years ago when they were looking for a heavy horse to carry knights into battle, is probably when this disease originated. So it's such an ancient mutation, it's impossible to name a lineage and say, this is the line that it comes from, because unlike HYPP, which is a recent mutation, this particular mutation is quite an ancient uh, disease. So this approach has also been used recently uh, by Dr. Banash in, at UC Davis to identify a skin disease called HERDA, which is found in quarter horses, hereditary equine regional dermal asthenia. And this is a picture of a horse that has HERDA, and it makes the skin um, very susceptible to trauma and then doesn't heal properly, so you get these uh, difficult scar formation. So this condition often is first noticed when horses are broke to ride and the saddle is put on the horse and it will develop um, saddle sores and uh, tears in the skin. It may be a slightly more elastic than normal and then a great deal of scar tissue formation. And currently this technique, the genome scans, are being used to look for other genetic diseases. Uh, for example, the form of tying up in thoroughbred horses called RER a second form of polysaccharide storage myopathy, which isn't accounted for by the mutation GYS1, so there are at least two types of PSSM, and a syndrome in, in Arabian horses called lavender foal syndrome, which is a, a fatal disorder in some Arabians. 
So how do we use that information then? We've used th these different approaches, and to date, these are the genetic mutations that we know about. So there are probably many, many more of them, but the, they have yet to be identified. And the majority of the ones that have been identified to date are recessive traits. So the severe combined immunodeficiency in Arabians, the ovarian lethal white syndrome in paint horses, junctional epidermal bullosa, bullosa in saddlebreds and Belgians, the GBED in quarter horse related breeds, and the and HERDA in quarter horse related breeds. And there are three known dominant traits so far, um, hyperkalemic creatic paralysis, PSSM, and another form of tying up uh, called malignant hyperthermia, which is found in quarter horse related breeds. And these horses may have um, an abnormal, abnormal reaction to uh, general anesthetics, and they also may show signs of tying up. So the important point to come back to then is if you have tested horses for these conditions and you have a breeding program, if you test your horses and they have a recessive condition and you're trying to breed away from it, it's, you recognize that for a recessive condition, you have to breed two carriers together most of the time in order to have an affected foal. So by avoiding breeding carriers of the trait to another carrier of the trait, you can successfully avoid having an affected foal. However, if you have a dominant disease, there are no carriers, you have it or you don't, and so there's a 50% chance each time you breed a dominant animal or more that you're going to have an affected foal. So a breeding program to try to breed away from traits with recessives is to breed carriers to normal individuals or clears and over time select for those individuals that have the genetic traits that you like um, that may be clear of the mutation. And if you do that, you can avoid having a skid foal, a foal with JEB, overall lethal white, GBED quite successfully. What becomes more difficult is dealing with dominant traits uh, in the breeding program, like HYPP or PSSM, in that if you have an affected individual, if you use that animal as a breeding animal, there's a 50% chance that that offspring will be affected. And then it becomes sort of an ethical question as to what are you going to do with an affected individual. If you breed to take the chance to have a normal individual, um, and you may end up with a, an affected individual. Are you going to identify that individual as having the defect and sell it? Are you going to keep it? Um, that becomes the difficult part of dealing with a dominant trait. So how do we use some of the genetic tests that are available? Well, they're nice to be able to use potentially if you're going to purchase an animal and you want to ensure that that animal doesn't have one of these genetic diseases, you can uh, do the genetic testing prior to purchase. Um, and if you own brood mares, you can do the genetic testing, but then what you want is to be able to go and find a stallion that is not a carrier of those traits. So you're looking for that information from the stallion owners. And that's kind of one of the conundrums that we're at at the present time with these genetic diseases. A lot of these tests are new, and we're at a point where stallion owners have to decide how they're going to deal with this um, genetic testing and whether they want to make that information available. They're sometimes understandably concerned about the impact of revealing this. In many cases, it's been demonstrated to be very helpful. For example, in Arabians, many of the stallions are listed as being carriers of, of combined immunodeficiency and owners are just um, not staying away from those stallions necessarily. They're just avoiding breeding a carrier to a carrier and therefore avoiding any possibility of having an affected individual. The thing that we don't know, however, is what we're going to do if you end up having, um, if you don't know that these genetic diseases exist. So uh, there's more genetic research that needs to be done in a diverse group of breeds so that we know what other potential genetic problems there might be out there. So I want to go through and talk about quarter horses because we know a lot about quarter horses and genetic diseases and it gives a nice example of how could we use these genetic tests that might be available. But I do want to say that one of the reasons we know the most about the quarter horse is not because I believe that they have more genetic mutations but it's because the Quarter Horse Association has been remarkably proactive in researching genetic diseases and providing funds for independent groups to look at these disorders and identify genetic mutations 
and in sitting um, down with their associations and determining what they're going to do with the results of genetic testing. And the other reason why we know more about quarter horses is because they're such a wonderful breed that there are many, many more quarter horses than any other breed of horse. So by having a large number of them with over 4 million registered, it's more likely that we might discover these diseases. And um, just to emphasize that point more, this is my quarter horse here. I own and, and love quarter horses, and, and I'm very, very fond of this breed. So identifying these genetic mutations is not meant to be a critique of the breed. What this shows you is um, results of a study that was we participated in with a group from University of California, Davis, that was published in the American uh, Journal of Veterinary Medicine. And there's it shows you the percentage of horses that have a copy of a mutated gene in the quarter horses and in paints. And you see that 1.5% of all quarter horses have HYPP. It means they have the genetic mutation um, and one copy at least of the gene is affected. And 11% of quarter horses have a polysaccharide storage myopathy, so quite a high percentage of quarter horses. And then in paints, the percentages are slightly less. When we look at recessive diseases, so we're looking at carriers, they have, again, one copy of the mutation, but they're just carriers. 11% of quarter horses are carriers of GBED, 3.5% for HERDA, and the ovarolethal white syndrome. <laughs> None of the individuals are affected in quarter horses, but a very high percentage of paints are carriers of the ovarolethal white syndrome. And the reason for that is that ovarial lethal white syndrome is uh, in its heterozygous form. So if you have one copy of the mutation, it gives you this beautiful frame ovarial coat color pattern, which is highly desirable. But if you breed two of these individuals together, there's a 25% chance of getting a lethal white foal. So sometimes we select for genetic mutations because in the heterozygous form, like in this case, it gives you a coat color pattern that is desirable, and it's just breeding the two carriers that results in the disease. The rest of this uh, shows you now if we look at specific quarter horse groups, so performance horse groups, and we looked at elite horses, to look at, well, what is the percentage of affected horses if we divide this up by uh, elite groups? And in halter horses, we find 56% of halter horses have HYPP. What's the reason for this high percentage? Well, it seems that there is a selection for halter horses that have HYPP because HYPP is associated with heavy muscling, and that's a very desirable appearance for horses in the halter horse ring. And we also have a, a very high percentage of halter horses with PSSM. And I'm not sure why that is, unless it's, it's possible that there's an overlap so that some popular stallions in the halter horse ring also happen to have PSSM and pass this along to halter horses. And they have a, a lower percentage of carriers for GBED and HERDA. When we look at Western pleasure horses, they have a, a similar uh, percentage of affected PSSM horses, a lower or a similar percentage of HYPP to the rest of the quarter horse breed, but they have quite a high percentage of carriers for GBED. I don't know that there's a selectional advantage for this, but it may be that some of the popular stallion lines happen to be carriers of um, GBED. And uh, we can see if we look at cutting horses, cutting horses, the biggest uh, genetic mutation that they carry is for HERDA. And that might be because that's more common in, in specific cutting horse stallions. And then the percentages are not, uh, are more similar to the overall quarter horse population as we look at rainers, uh, cow horses, barrel horses, and race horses. And they, um, genetic mutation rate in these individuals is much lower. You also find, if you look at the pedigrees of barrel horses and race horses, that they have a lot more thoroughbred in them as well, which might be why they have fewer of some of these genetic mutations. So part of the issue can arise when you have very popular stallions. So there is a tendency to want to breed to the best and to breed to some of the top quarter horse stallions. And 
particularly now that we have artificial insemination, we can really concentrate the genetics of some of these top stallions, which gives us some of their very beneficial traits, but if they happen to have a genetic disease, we can also inadvertently pass along a genetic disease to a large number of offspring of a very popular sire. And that's the um, meaning of the popular sire syndrome, is that you pass on all of these great traits, and then you inadvertently pass along detrimental traits, which many generations later turn out to uh, result in a genetic disease. So an example of that would be, for example, Impressive, as we've talked about, has uh, beautiful, heavily muscled offspring that are um, doing very well in the halter horse show ring. And he had about 400,000 descendants because of his popularity. And the HYPP percentages are about 56% in that breed. And so we have a large number of animals that have HYPP because of the popularity of that stallion in the halter horse line. And we have much fewer of them in many of the other uh, quarter horse types, like cutting horses, for example, because there was no selectional advantage for this disease. If you look at cutting horses, however, there are a lot of cutting horses that are related to Poco Bueno because he was such an exceptional producer of cutting horses. He himself only produced 400 foals, but now with AI and many of those other and artificial insemination techniques, each of his two grandsons produced 1,300 foals. So they have a great deal more potency of passing their genes along in the breed. And Poco Bueno has about 2 million descendants. And we believe, um, based on the research that's been done, that Herda goes through with Poco Bueno. And therefore, there's potentially a very high percentage of cutting horses that ha are carriers for Herda. So these are uh, just examples of how, when we're looking for the popular traits and the beneficial traits that many of these uh, stallions have, we sometimes inadvertently, without knowing it, end up having other uh, detrimental traits that get passed on as well. It's not just in quarter horses. Uh, these examples are because most of the research has been done in quarter horses. But this problem is actually more severe in breeds where there are a very small number of offspring, or registered horses. And an example of that would be uh, the North American draft horse, the Belgian draft horse. There were very few draft horses left after the First World War, and the Second World War, they were even smaller numbers. And therefore, there were only a few breeding stallions um, that were left in North America. And now this breed has expanded greatly, um, and there are many Belgian draft horses, about 50,000 of them uh, in existence today. And if any of those few stallions that were left after the Second World War had recessive mutations or dominant mutations we weren't aware of, they had the ability to pass that along to most of the modern day horses. For example, when we looked at Belgians for the presence of the GYS1 mutation for PSSM, we find that 30% of them are heterozygous for that dominant mutation, so they have PSSM. But 9% of them are homozygous for the dominant mutation, so both genes are affected. So about 40% of the Belgian breed is affected by PSSM. And similar work done by Dr. John Baird shows that there are a very high percentage of carriers of JEB in the Belgian population, likely because of the high degree of relatedness and the very small um, number of horses that were left after the Second World War, so they share a lot of genes in common. So how are we going to deal with this, this information? I think really it's just the tip of the iceberg as we know more and more about the genetic traits in horses. And hopefully as more breed associations invest into genetic research in their own breeds, there will be more information available to breeders to be able to utilize these tests and try to avoid breeding carriers or avoid propagating dominant traits that are uh, deleterious to horses. But it also requires that breeders are interested in utilizing the test, both stallion owners and mare owners. And if they're not interested in using the test to select away from traits, then it really doesn't have much of an impact on the genetic health of the breed. An example of that would be HYPP in which uh, testing became mandatory, according to the American Quarter Horse Association, in 1998. And if you compare the gene frequency 
at the time that testing became mandatory to the gene frequency in 2008, there was not a change in the gene frequency at all. So the test wasn't being used to try to select away from horses that had HYPP. Why was that? Because they did better in the show ring. Uh, it was considered a desirable trait by many breeders. And so the, this was not used to try to decrease the frequency of this particular genetic mutation. And as a result, the uh, AQHA registration decided that not only did horses have to be tested, but if they were homozygous for the dominant trait, they could no longer be registered. And many individuals that are homozygous for this trait have severe respiratory problems and difficulty uh, breathing from time to time, more severe clinical signs. And also decided that in the year 2020, horses that are heterozygous for the mutation for HYPP will no longer be registered. So the breed association decided to put pressure on trying to reduce the gene frequency of HYPP. So if you're interested in these genetic tests, where can you get testing done? Most tests are patented. Uh, the University of Minnesota, for example, patented the GBED test, and uh, Drs. Mickelson, McHugh, and I um, were involved in patenting the PSSM test, which I am um, telling you so that you realize that there may potentially be a conflict of interest. And then once these tests are patented, there are specific laboratories that are licensed to do testing uh, because those laboratories, are, the labs feel very confident in, in the results that are being produced. And then licensed laboratories usually provide a lot of genetic advice. Um, there are some labs that are running tests that are not authorized to perform those tests. And many times you'll get test results back, but they won't have anyone that you can talk to to get any advice from it. And they're not authorized laboratories. So the authorized uh, labs, some of those that are performing testing for combined immunodeficiency in Arabian's uh, vet gen, and you can um, Google most of these and find their websites, and they have a lot of great information online about how to submit and perform testing. GBED is done by vet gen and UC Davis. Lethal White uh, is done at UC Davis. HYPP and HERDA are all done at UC Davis. The uh, JEB is done at UC Davis, and in saddle breads, it's a different mutation. It's done at the University of Kentucky at the Gluck Institute. And the Diagnostic Laboratory at the University of Minnesota is performing testing for PSSM and malignant hyperthermia. So they almost always have a forms that you can download online, um, and it will give you s information about how to submit uh, genetic testing to those laboratories. So I hope I've kind of walked you through some of the genetic discoveries that have been made. I think based on the fact that we have some really great tools provided to us by um, the gene chips that were funded to a large extent by the Morris Animal Foundation, the USDA, and the American Quarter Horse Association, the Grayson Jockey Club, and, and many individual donors, that provides us now with an opportunity to find a lot of genetic diseases. And you'll find more of these um, discoveries coming up in the future, and hopefully Within smaller breeds, there will be um, an interest together by breeders to try to identify some of the genetic mutations so that they also have the ability to test for some of these traits and continue to improve the breed. And then once the tests are available, really there is going to be a lot of ethical discussions amongst breeders and owners and breed associations in how they want to use the tests, whether they want to um, make testing mandatory or whether they want this to be a voluntary activity in um, applying the tests and using them in the future to try to um, maintain their breed and improve the genetics of their breed. And so with that, I would um, be happy to answer any questions that anybody might have on some of the genetic discussion that we've just had. I'm hoping that you've heard me. And I'll just remind you that if you want to ask questions, oh, there you go. You can type them in the text, text chat. 
So one of the questions was, is there a way to you know, encourage people to be more, more concerned about these issues? And I'm really open to any, any suggestions that you have. We've, um, you know, I think the My Horse Use initiative here to try to get these concerns out to people to try to provide. I know a lot of people are a little intimidated by genetics, but you don't really have to have a tremendous understanding of DNA and uh, all of its intricacies to understand how to apply some of this information to breeding programs. So this will be posted and uh, we've tried to talk to as many horse owner magazines as we can and speaking at veterinary conferences to make this more known. So what I, I'm not intimately familiar, another question here is about the Arabian Horse Show Association and steps they've taken to limit registration of skid carriers. To my knowledge, I don't don't think that it's uh, mandatory per se, but I do believe that Arabian horse owners have um, embraced that genetic test, and that many stallion owners are, are advertising whether their their animals or carriers are clear, and that they've worked in that fashion on a voluntary basis to decrease uh, the incidence of of skids in Arabians. But I don't know if it, if there's uh, I haven't seen any information that shows whether or not that has decreased over time. So uh, one of the other questions that was asked is the percentage of horses that are currently affected with HERDA. And I'm going to go back uh, to one of the previous slides. And this is showing you that in, in um, HERDA in general in quarter horses, it's 3.5% are carriers. Um, and I don't know that there are statistics on how many of them that are actually born with HERDA per se. I can't answer that uh, specifically. Certainly, the cutting horse uh, breeders are concerned to a large extent in Western Pleasure because the carriers are so high, but there isn't a record that's being kept of how many individuals are produced that are affected. Uh, who provides genetic counseling? A, lo a lot of times, uh, to my knowledge, the individual companies that provide the genetic testing, for example, will help you with the interpreting their test results. Some uh, well-versed veterinarians may provide that service. For us here at University of Minnesota, we uh, counsel people with regard to the ones that we've been involved in, like glycogen branching enzyme deficiency, ovarian lethal white, PSSM, um, and malignant hyperthermia. Does anybody else have any questions that I might be able to answer? I guess I would have a question for people, and that is, are any of you using um, these genetic tests? And are, are you feeling like this is something that y you want to have more information about in breeding programs. I know uh, in speaking with some owners, one of the frustrations has been that they've tested their mares and they know whether their mares are carriers or not, but they are having difficulty identifying stallions to breed to um, that have also performed the genetic testing so that they can um, avoid breeding to carriers of some of these traits. Okay, well, if uh, there aren't any more questions, I would be, um, I would be uh, happy to answer. But if there aren't any more, I would like to thank you for your attention and for, you for tuning in to us. And I uh, wish you all a good day. And uh, wish you all a good day. Okay, great. Thanks. I just wanted to um, also thank you for coming. And I definitely want to thank Dr. Valberg for her presentation this afternoon um, and for Dr. Mickelson for being available to answer your questions. And um, 
You will soon receive an invitation to participate in an online survey about this afternoon's webcast, so we would appreciate if you would take a few minutes to give us your feedback when you receive that email. There will be more webcasts in this series on equine genetics. Um, you can check our website, myhorseuniversity.com, for updates. Our next My Horse University Horse Quest free monthly webcast will be presented on November 24th at 7 p.m., and that topic is Why Won't My Mare Get Pregnant? Uh, please remember that this webcast was recorded and will be uploaded to our website by the end of the week. Feel free to send us your comments and suggestions to info at myhorseuniversity.com. Um, and thanks again, and hope you have a great afternoon.